All right. So, um, so okay, this is lecture seven of ECE 503. And so today's lecture is really important because it sort of sets the context of why we have signal processing in the first place, or one of the reasons for having signal processing. So for, for instance, uh, like I mentioned earlier on in this course, especially lecture one, where you have the French term uh, traitement de signaux, which means the treatment of signals. Um, before you can treat a signal, you need to analyze it. You need to see what sort of information is contained within it, you know, before you can act on it. Like what's present, uh, what things you want to extract, what you want to enhance, uh, what you want to sort of reject. Like for instance, if you have a speech signal, which operates between zero and eight kilohertz, and then you have an annoying sinusoidal tone somewhere. So you talk like this, and then in the, somewhere in the background you hear, <laughs> kind of annoying, right? With uh, DSP and what we're about to look at, um, it is possible to analyze that signal and figure out where is that presence of that annoying sort of um, artifact, that interference tone, and extract it. But you have to know where it's located. So in, what we're going to be dealing with is something called frequency analysis. And in order to understand frequency analysis, you've got to understand how it works in terms of, um, you know, what, like, you know, you have a time domain signal, and it gives you a perspective in the time domain of the behavior of your, um, you know, whatever you're observing, whether it's speech signal, an audio signal, a wireless communication signal, or some sensor reading from a robot or a biomedical processing unit or um, a building that's rigged with a bunch of sensors sending information. Um, however, there's a beautiful dimension that most people don't realize, which is called the frequency domain, right? And so we might ask ourselves, what's this frequency domain? So the frequency domain... Um, kind of stems back from the fact that we can decompose any time domain signal. Uh, no, decompose sounds kind of negative. We can represent any time domain signal, and there's some conditions, and I'll describe what the conditions are, by a combination of complex weighted, complex harmonically related exponentials, and we can completely characterize it as the sum of those. All right? So this is something that ties to Fourier and uh, the work that he did uh, several centuries ago. And, and as a result, it give, gave, gives rise to things called Fourier series and Fourier uh, transforms. And so we're going to be looking at this in a little bit more detail in this lecture. And then, we're, so first of all, in this lecture, we're going to look at everything from a continuous time perspective. And the reason why I'm doing it is it's a little bit more tractable to understand things from a continuous time perspective. And then once we digitize, which obviously a lot of us will, right? Those building sensors, um, are my wireless communication devices, my cell phones, my software-defined radios, um, um, a lot of devices usually take the world around us, those analog or the continuous time signals, digitizes them, and all we're playing with in the end. Do you think we're playing with the analog signals anymore? Absolutely not. So we need to make that bridge from continuous time to discrete time, and that's what lecture eight is going to be about. And then lecture nine is a little bit more about the properties of these types of signals. So um, going back to what I mentioned before, like, you know, we can represent waveforms, signals of information, systems as a combination of weighted sinusoidal components. And it's kind of interesting. Different tools are designed for different types of uh, waveforms. If the waveform is periodic, we have a set or a category of tools, mathematical tools. So remember, we're engineers, right? So engineers uh, theoretically should have math as a tool. Um, power drill is not bad, but definitely math. And so if the signal that we're looking at is periodic in nature, we need to have a certain set of tools, right? And then on the other hand, if it's uh, aperiodic, let's say it only happens once. You know, here's a waveform, and that's it. It doesn't repeat itself. We never see it again. Then we need a different set of tools. And so um, Fourier himself came up with a couple of ways of dealing with those two scenarios, which we're going to look at right now. Okay? So this is in your course textbook. And, and it's, it's kind of cute, I, uh, but, but, it's, uh, but, uh, but it does get to the point. Um, so imagine, okay, 
imagine this is your uh, prism, right? Like most of you probably have dealt with a prism, you know, in physics class, wow, I want to play with a prism. And you shine white light through it, and then it's all these colors, right? Well, this is kind of, in a, in a, in a way, uh, this is actually kind of what we're doing. This is what kind of I inspires this type of Fourier series and Fourier transforms, this frequency analysis, which is white light. White light consists of all these color light combined together, right? That's how you get white light. Just like the idea, if you take my comms course, something called white noise. Why do we call it white noise? Because there's equal energy contributions across all frequencies. And you might say, well, how about here? Well, light, like violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red, all these guys, um, if you ever want to remember that, like, you know, that sequence, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Um, I don't know. My older sister was really good at concocting ways of remembering stuff like this. Uh, Roy G. Biv, okay? So if you ever want to remember that, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And what happens is each one of, the, each one of this is light. Each one of these colors represents light at a specific frequency. And, when you sum, and what happens is all of this constitutes white light, right? And so, as a result, like, you know, this is one, one technique where if you want to decompose a single signal into its individual frequency components, you can use a prism. That's great. But what about wireless signals? What about audio signals, the sound signals that we hear? Okay? Other signals. How can we decompose those signals into its individual frequency components, into individual sinusoidal excitations, right? Like sines and cosines um, that are complex and are complex weighted. How can, we how can we decompose a signal into those basic fundamental signals that's built from? And that's what 4A told us. And so what you do is one of several things. So first of all, what we're going to see in this lecture and lecture eight is uh, we're going to deal with continuous time periodic and aperiodic signals and discrete time periodic and aperiodic signals. And this gives rise to Fourier series. So series means that we're only dealing with periodic waveforms that we're trying to analyze. And if they're discrete, then there's one set of tools for that. And if they're the continuous time, then we have another set of tools. And then if something's aperiodic, here's a waveform, we use the transform. Okay, and now we're just going to jump in headfirst into what these things are. So your book, let's, let's do periodic first, okay? <laughs> Seems like that's the convention, w why not? So, continuous time periodic signals, let's use the definition. Let's actually represent a continuous time periodic signal. Let's say it's called X of T. You know, how original. <laughs> but... X of t, as you notice, okay, the way it's represented is an infinite summation, infinite, of C of k. C of k can be complex, okay? And it's multiplied by e to the j 2 pi k f naught of t. And you might say, okay, I don't, I don't see any sinusoids there, uh, uh, prof. Like, what's going on? OK, and, and I put that little scribble next to it, right? This is, this is how I keep track of sometimes of things, because I, I just, my brain goes a mile a minute, and you know, I forget some of the subtleties. Why, what is e to the j 2 pi k f naught of t? So that can be represented by cosine 2 pi k f naught of t plus j sine 2 pi k f naught of t. It's Euler's relation. There is actually a divide by 2 in there somewhere. But Euler's relation, that's where we get the sine and cosine. We get that sinusoidal contribution, right? So beautiful. Like, you know, these things exist in nature. Well, it depends which physicist you talk with. But for the most part, I like to think of energy, like signals and um, radiation, light, um, uh, wireless signals, audio signals. I like to perceive them as looking like waves traveling through space, and there's some energy in them. And so it's elegant. Like, you have. Like, you know, both sine and cosine, uh, one's imaginary, one's real, propagating through space, right? And they're weighed, they're weighed by CK there. And then furthermore, 
you have a bunch of sines and cosines, right? And they're all weighed differently with different CKs. So we have CK, K equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the combination of all these guys, we can create any waveform. We can create square waveforms. We can create triangular waveforms. We can tr create almost any waveform that you want. And their conditions, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to get to the conditions, the Dirichlet conditions. But what happens is that top box, what that tells me is that I can make any waveform that I so choose using uh, these complex sines and cosines, these complex weights, all multiplied together, all summed together from minus infinity to infinity. Ta-da! Okay? And then the bottom guy, you might say, okay, integral, what's the deal there? Well... This is a deal. So first of all, uh, you don't want to integrate from minus infinity to infinity because it's periodic, right? You're going to go forever and ever and ever and ever, and it's just not going to end. It's going to look bad, right? So what we do is we take just a single period of uh, that, that waveform, right? We take x of, of t, integrate across its period, one period, and then times e to the minus j 2 pi k f naught of t dt and then 1 over Tp, and that gives us Ck. Now, what, what's, what's interesting of this? This second equation, if you think about it, um, this, this kind of, um, and I've, I've been talking about this in my other class as well, um, in many ways looks like some sort of correlation property. So what happens is, I know, correlation, like, you know, that's a probability term, yes, but I'm going to bring it here. What happens is, what I'm looking at here is I have x of t. I want to extract out just the one sinusoidal term, the cosine and the sine, that corresponds to ck. So I project x of t onto that one waveform. And assuming that everything else is orthogonal, and it is because what we do is we choose f naught. First of all, sine and cosine they're orthogonal with each other. And then what I do is I choose different frequencies. And not only different frequencies, harmonically related. There's a base frequency, F0, and then they're separated by integer multiples of each other. They're harmonically related. So they too, they're, they're detached. So what I do in that bottom guy is the projection of X of T on the one desired cosine and sine, the 1 e to the j, blah, 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 and that extracts out that weight, that desired weight, okay? So I didn't have to go through the mathematical rigmarole. You can check in your textbook for that. But what that guy is doing is essentially what part of x of t projects onto that complex exponential. And ta-da, gives you ck. And then what I mentioned about the harmonically related frequencies, right? So that's really, really cool stuff. So as a result, uh, this is all great. Like, I'm going to do this with every waveform. Try and stop me now. Woo! You know? <laughs> but but, but no, hold your horses. It's, it's not, actually, um, not actually that easy because uh, I mentioned Dirichlet. And I forgot if he was French or German or Swiss. It's like, they're all like, you know, I'm not sure if any of you have subscribed to the Mathematical Genealogy Project. Um, it's actually pretty cool. So electrical engineering, um, if you find like electrical engineering professors, eventually they'll have their roots with math and physics professors, and then they go all the way back to one of the Bernoullis, um, uh, Reinhard Euler, or one of those like really, really famous 16th and 17th century scientists and stuff. It's really cool. So those two guys created a bunch of PhD graduates who then created a bunch of PhD graduates and this is tree and then it just expands like, like mad. I'm still trying to figure out where my roots are. Am I related to a Bernoulli or to a Euler? I still don't know. Anyways, uh, Dearest Schley said three things that um, where this would or will not work. So first of all, um, what happens is we need to know that this waveform, like, you know, when we do this Fourier series representation, is we need to know that the series converges. If it ain't converging, it ain't having a Fourier series, okay? <laughs> oh my god, like I'm teaching poor English in the process. So, um, so Dirichlet said the following. So first of all, x of t 
must have a finite number of discontinuities in any period. You just can't have this thing go, oh, this kind of discontinuity, discontinuity, and it just goes on and on and on, and it's uncountable. That's a problem. So you can't have infinite number of discontinuities in any period. Once you have that, all bets are off with respect, with respect to um, finding a Fourier series representation. The second is that the signal x of t contains a finite number of maxima and minima in any period. Again, you don't want this thing to um, have too many of these, otherwise it will not satisfy the condition. And then third, and uh, not least, is um, absolutely integrable. And what does that mean? It means this. So if I take x of t over its period, and so I take the absolute value of x of t and integrate across its period, it must be less than infinity. So these are the three conditions. Um, in general, you would be hard pressed to find those waveforms. You would have to be very creative to find those waveforms. But you can definitely have fun and say, oh, let's invent a waveform that does not satisfy Dirichlet's condition. If you do that and then try and take its Fourier series, uh, you probably will not be able to create um, that Fourier series from that. But so, so that's why I say there are, like, you know, when I say any waveform can, be, can have a Fourier series representation that's periodic, asterisks, that's the asterisk. That is the condition saying all bets are off if any of these are violated. All right. The one thing that, you know, people always, like, you know, every textbook that I've ever read in Signals and Systems or DSP um, talks about is this idea of Parseval's theorem. And so it's this beautiful relationship between the time and the frequency domain. So, so in this sense, okay, so first let's back up. So you've got to calm down, go less than a mile a minute. Okay. Um, when we're in continuous time, periodic signals, and we have the waveform x of t, and we have these coefficients, c of k, from which we can use in order to represent x of t. Okay? Those coefficients produce are, are like essentially that's the frequency representation. What happens is every coefficient there corresponds to a multiple of f naught. On the other hand, x of t is our time domain signal. Now what we want to see is there a relationship between the ck coefficients, which is the frequency representation. Each one represents at a specific frequency, oh, here's the weight for this frequency of sines and cosines, and this guy here, this coefficient belongs to these frequencies of sines and cosines and so on and so forth, sum together to make your time domain waveform. Now, can we calculate what the energy of that signal is using both time domain techniques and these frequency coefficients? And the answer is yes. And that's Parseval's theorem. And we're going to see it four times, not one, not two, not three, four. Four times in tonight's lectures. Okay? So the first one is this guy here. And again, it's a little hokey. So let's find out what the average power is. And the reason why we use power is heads up, energy is infinite. You might say, why? And the reason is, is that the problem with energy is that it's not constrained to a single period. It just goes, right? So we need to actually look at a single period and say, what is the power in that period? Right? If it's aperiodic, energy is cool. If it's, not, if it's periodic and goes on and on and on and on, energy just blows up. It's just like you have a signal that goes on and on and on. So, as a result, when we have this signal, um, let's say we take the definition. So, P power equals 1 over the period. So, we're normalizing it by time. And then you integrate across that period the magnitude squared, right? So remember, so remember what, um, uh, you know, volts and amps and resistance, right? What's the relationship of power to, like, volts and stuff? Like, the signal amplitude is a squared relationship. So this makes sense. So magnitude squared of the signal integrated across one period and then normalized by the period itself gives us the power of that signal. That's cool. Is there an easier way? Let's say I have a bunch of CKs that are doing nothing. Hmm, CKs. I wonder what else stands for CK. What ends up happening is if we use the definition of the magnitude squared, right? And it's possible that X of T is complex as well. Um, we know that the magnitude squared is essentially the product of X of T with the complex conjugate of itself. 
if we replace it with the expression for what x of t is equal to and plug it in here into this integral, it turns out that Parseval's relation says that the power of the signal is equal to the magnitude squared of the coefficients summed all together. So you can either take the integral of the waveform across one period and normalize it by the period, or you can sum up the squares of the coefficients. Either way, that's going to give you the exact same answer, right? So that's Parseval's relationship. And then what I was mentioning before, if let's say you take the magnitude squared of every one of those coefficients and map it to each frequency, this thing here, like so remember I was talking about like the rep like you know, what's the weight of the weighing of every sinusoid that you need to sum together to make that x of t? What happens is if you take the magnitude square of every one of those coefficients corresponding to every one of those frequencies, and remember they're harmonically related, 0, f0, f0, 2f0, 3f0, da 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 da, all the way to plus infinity and also to minus infinity, what you get is this thing here is called line spectra, right? So this is the, the, the continuous time Fourier series representation of the frequency domain. So you have a periodic continuous time waveform, and it can be represented in the frequency domain by this thing here called line spectra. What we're going to see is that the other three forms, a continuous time aperiodic waveform, will have a different looking type of frequency representation. And then the discrete time waveforms, both periodic and aperiodic, they too will have very different looking frequency representations. So notice that this is discrete in the frequency domain, and it stretches out from minus infinity to infinity. It's not periodic. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, other than the, um, uh, there's a, you know, value at every multiple of f naught, it is essentially zero in between. It's very discrete, all right? So, so this is actually pretty cool. So if you ever deal with a continuous, so if you ever do continuous time signal processing, so you don't digitize it or discretize it in any which way, so suppose you have some really cool equipment, or you make it yourself with resistors and capacitors and inductors, and you're able to convert it into the frequency domain, you will get something that looks like that, all right? Of course, I've never played with anything like that. I grew up in a digital age. <laughs> okay, so that's part one. Part two is the Fourier transform for a continuous time aperiodic signal. Almost the same math. Almost. But not quite. So what happens is we're going to use the same math, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do something kind of like a nice little trick with that. And the trick is we're going to, like, so... So what? I so we're, we're going to be changing our understanding, or basically the premise of our waveform. So an aperiodic signal. So this is what all of you should remember when you're playing with this type of signal. An aperiodic waveform is a periodic waveform, but the period goes to infinity. <laughs> yeah, it's like very long period. No, seriously. So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, like, let's go back to the original slide. So remember these two relationships. Uh, the premise here is that we have a one, we have a TP here, we have a one over TP here. What we're going to do, when I say let the period go to infinity, we're going to take limits. We're going to establish limits to these equations, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that that x of t, suppose it has a cousin, xp of t. Let's say xp of t is one period of a periodic waveform. And it has period tp. But we just take the one and it's zero outside of tp, right? Now, in, in, uh, the, um, in the continuous time periodic w world, we would have TP, 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 all the way from minus infinity to infinity. Not here. What we're going to do is we're going to say, we got TP. But what's going to happen is, let's say we don't see the next TP on either side, or the copy of it, from until minus infinity or infinity. 
So what we're going to do is essentially, yeah, there's a periodic copy, and the other copy is at infinity. Go, t go after it, right? <laughs> you know, tricking people. It's almost like, you know, pretending to play with a dog and a ball, and then you pretend to throw the ball, but you actually still have it, and the dog's like, you know, oh, my dog loves that. So, <laughs> and then I really throw it, and then he thinks I'm kidding, but I'm not. So, what ends up happening is our x of t can be a periodic waveform, but a period of one waveform in the next period is at infinity and minus infinity. Okay? And so, that, that's the, what happens is the, the restriction here, as we'll see later, is that that tp, um, uh, for that xt of p, outside of that period, is going to be zero, right? So we take one copy, we extend TP to infinity, it becomes an aperiodic waveform. Let's plug this guy in to the previous setup. So that X, uh, sorry, sorry, that uh, C of K, CK, if we plug that in, so the original C of K was this guy here. Remember, this is how we get those spectral lines, that, those uh, line spectra. So now let's plug in X P of t, and take the limit of the tp to go to infinity, right? So we have this, cool. What we're also doing is, just as before, we set the limits on the integration to be across one period, and now what we do is we play a few tricks. So first of all, let's replace uh, x, uh, sorry, xpt, with x, and we let x equals 0 for everything outside of that period, like what I mentioned before. And then what we do, okay, is we, we play around with things. So first of all, we multiply both, both sides of this expression, left hand and right hand side, with tp. And we call that cktp, we call him x, big x, big x of f. Okay? And then that guy, well, okay, so far so good. He's still there. And so if we do that, this is our new expression. Okay? So we're making this assumption okay, that the next replica is at minus infinity and plus infinity. We assume that other than the, the, that waveform xtp of t, everything between let's say the non-zero portion, and from minus infinity to infinity is all zero, right? So if we integrate it, it's going to be finite within that region. Like if we go from, integrate from minus infinity to infinity, we just are integrating that one copy. And then maybe at infinity we'll see the other copy, right? Right? So, given that, we have this representation. It's very powerful. So notice how that limit, now we go off to infinity and minus infinity. We don't worry about the tp, the 1 over tp, the normalization, because he's contained with the x of f. And so what we call this here, this is what we call the analysis equation for the Fourier transform. The synthesis expression, almost the same fun, almost the same manipulation. Um, in this case, what we do is we define a delta f and you know where I'm going with this, folks. I'm going to turn the summation into an integral. I'm so totally going to do that. So how I'm going to do that? Well, sir, first of all, again, I take the expression. So I have initially that x of t thing, and I use those complex weights, ck. I'm going to replace ck with uh, that um, x of f, and I'm going to replace x of f. So what's f? So f is a 1 over t. It's some sort of period, time time function. So in this case, I change that. I replace it, the argument, with k, k divided by tp. What happens is what I've just done is I've turned f into, first of all, I know these things are harmonically related, so it could be one of these guys, and they're all spaced out by f naught, right? So what I've done is, so I know that like that summation takes these discrete x of f's, right? At f naught, 2 f naught, 3 f naught, 4 f naught. I replace it with an integer. And what's f naught? 1 over tp. Now, I'm going to replace 1 over tp with delta f. And what's delta f? Well, delta f is supposed to be really tiny. How tiny? 
um, as Mr. Bean would say, microscopic, right? But no, actually, funny thing, Mr. Bean, uh, Rowan Atkinson, is actually an electrical engineer, or at least he had education as one before he went into comedy. So anyways, side note. So that guy, to me, screams, when I see delta F, I want to transform into DF. I want to see basically an infinitesimal number of delta Fs. I want a continuum of values. So I'm going to transform that summation into an integral. And when I do that, this guy here, okay? So when I play with the limits and I make delta F really tiny, this guy now becomes the synthesis equation for the Fourier transform. Whew. So this guy, so whenever you have an aperiodic waveform and you want to find out what's his frequency content, if I want to understand at every infinitesimal frequency, every possible sinusoid, like what its complex weighting is, how much of that sinusoid is contained in X of T, which is aperiodic waveform, what I do is I use that waveform there, right? This guy here, X of F, big F, gives me all the infinite number of weights for all frequencies that represent X of T. And suppose I'm given all frequency weights, X of F, and I want to get the original waveform back, I use that expression there. Okay? So this is two of four. Okay? So this is part two. This is when we have continuous time, and we have an aperiodic waveform. And just as before, Dirichlet, which I believe is the proper pronunciation, what happens is same stuff. Signal's got to be finite number of discontinuities, um, you ha and finite discontinuities too. You can only have a finite number of maxima and minima, and it's absolutely integrable. Failing any of those, you do not have a Fourier representation. Okay? In French, speaking of Dirichlet, like, uh, if you do not have that, you know, in French they say, je suis désolé, which means I am very sorry. So, if you ever go to Quebec, now you know, um, you know, if someone says you have gum or something, je suis désolé, they'll think you're a local. So, and just as before, this is, you know, it's going to be deja vu all over again. What we have is Parseval's relationship. Here, we have energy. Why? Because the waveform is not periodic. And therefore, we can actually represent it in terms of an energy rather than a power. And so if we do it, we have the exact same thing. We have this absolute, um, no, this magnitude squared of either the frequency representation of x or the time domain version of x. And if we integrate from minus infinity to infinity, both of them should give us the energy of that signal. All right? What's really interesting and this is going to come up quite a few times later on in this course, and I'm just going to like, um, um, you know, bring it up just a little bit, is this idea of this guy here. So we saw line spectra, right? So we saw that CK squared business and um, at zero frequency, at f naught frequency, at 2 f naught, 3 f naught, 4 f naught, 5 f naught, doot, 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 doot. And we have the C magnitude squares of the CKs going and creating. And that is our frequency contributions at every frequency of every sinusoid for that XT. This guy is actually powerful stuff. The magnitude squared of X of F, right? That gives us the power spectral density of X of T. And what this means, okay? What this means is exactly the same thing as a line spectra, but it's across a continuum of frequencies, right? So, so here's one lesson learned in today's um, you know, lecture seven, which is, which is the following. If you have a continuous time periodic signal, time domain signal, um, the, the frequency representation uh, consists of aperiodic discrete um, uh, values, right, at 0, f naught, 2 f naught, 3 f naught, to infinity and minus infinity. If you have a continuous time, aperiodic time domain signal, its frequency representation will also be aperiodic, okay, in the frequency domain, and it's a continuum 
of values, right? What we're going to see in lecture eight is that we're going to see when we have discrete time, the game's a little different. What we're going to have is we're going to have um, both we're going to have periodic periodic representations in the frequency domain of these signals, whether it's aperiodic or periodic discrete time signals. Okay, so just a heads up. And the other thing, oh, the other thing about um, energy density spectra is that later on when you want to see how systems, how systems like filters and such um, manipulate these energy spectra, there's something called Einstein-Wiener-Kinchin theorem. What happens is this spectra will get manipulated and filtered in a particular way. So you wonder how does this energy propagate through a system? That, that, that property, EWK, will define how it's done. And we'll talk about that later in this course as well. Okay, so that uh, concludes lecture seven. Okay, so uh, what we'll do is, um, you know, so, so again, uh, just as a heads up,